Track Four, The Woman in White. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Woman in White by Wilkie Collins, read by Tim Bulkley of BigBible.org. Anne Catherick, read by Ezwa. Track Four. The first epoch. Ten. It was on a Thursday in the week, and nearly the end of the third month of my sojourn in Cumberland. In the morning, when I went down into the breakfast room at the usual hour, Miss Halcombe, for the first time since I'd known her, was absent from her customary place at the table. Miss Fairley was out on the lawn. She bowed to me, but did not come in. Not a word had dropped from my lips or from hers that would unsettle either of us. Yet the same unacknowledged sense of embarrassment made us shrink alike from meeting one another alone. She waited on the lawn, and I waited in the breakfast-room, until Mrs. Vasey or Miss Halcombe came in. How quickly I should have joined her, how readily we should have shaken hands and glided into our customary talk, only a fortnight ago. In a few minutes Miss Halcombe entered. She had a preoccupied look, and she made her apologies for being late rather absently. "'I've been detained,' she said, by a consultation with Mr. Fairley on a domestic matter, which he wished to speak to me about. Miss Fairley came in from the garden, and the usual morning greeting passed between us. Her hand struck colder to mine than ever. She did not look at me, and she was very pale. Even Mrs. Vasey noticed it when she entered the room a moment after. "'I suppose it's the change in the wind,' said the old lady. "'The winter is coming. Ah, my love, the winter is coming soon.' In her heart and in mine it had come already. Our morning meal, once so full of pleasant, good-humoured discussion of the plans of the day, was short and silent. Miss Fairley seemed to feel the oppression of the long pauses in the conversation, and looked appealingly to her sister to fill them up. Miss Halcombe, after once or twice hesitating and checking herself, in a most uncharacteristic manner, spoke at last. "'I've seen your uncle this morning, Laura,' she said. "'He thinks the purple room is the one that ought to be got ready, and he confirms what I told you. Monday is the day, not Tuesday.' While these words were being spoken, Miss Fairley looked down at the table beneath her. Her fingers moved nervously among the crumbs that were scattered on the cloth. The paleness of her cheeks spread to her lips, and the lips themselves trembled visibly. I was not the only person present who noticed this. Miss Halcombe saw it too, and at once set us the example of rising from the table. Mrs. Vasey and Miss Fairley left the room together. The kind, sorrowful blue eyes looked at me for a moment with the prescient sadness of a coming and a long farewell. I felt the answering pang in my own heart, the pang that told me I must lose her soon, and love her the more unchangeably for the loss. I turned towards the garden, when the door had closed on her. Miss Halcombe was standing, with her hat in her hand, and her shawl over her arm, by the large window that led out to the lawn, and was looking at me attentively. "'Have you any leisure time to spare?' she asked. "'Before you begin to work in your own room?' "'Certainly, Miss Halcombe. "'I have always time at your service. "'I want to say a word to you in private, Mr. Hartwright. "'Get your hat and come out into the garden. "'We are not likely to be disturbed there at this hour of the morning.' "'As we stepped out onto the lawn, "'one of the under-gardeners, a mere lad, "'passed us on his way to the house with a letter in his hand. "'Miss Halcombe stopped him. "'Is that letter for me?' she asked. "'Nay, miss. "'It's just said to be for Miss Fairley,' answered the lad, holding out the letter as he spoke. Miss Halcombe took it from him, and looked at the address. Ah, "'Strange handwriting,' she said to herself. "'Who can Laura's correspondent be? "'Where did you get this?' she continued, addressing the gardener. "'Well, miss,' said the lad, "'I got it from a woman.' "'What woman?' A woman well stricken in age. Ah, an old woman. Anyone you knew? I cannot tack it on myself to say that she was other than a stranger to me. Which way did she go? That gate, said the under-gardener, turning with great deliberation towards the south, and embracing the whole of that part of England with one comprehensive sweep of his arm. Curious. 
said Miss Halcombe. I suppose it must be a begging letter. There, she added, handing the letter back to the lad. Take it to the house and give it to one of the servants. Now, Mr. Hartright, if you've no objection, let's walk this way. She led me across the lawn, along the same path by which I had followed her, on the day after my arrival at Limeridge. At the little summer-house, in which Laura Fairley and I had first seen each other, she stopped, and broke the silence which she had steadily maintained while we were walking together. What I have to say to you I can say here. With those words she entered the summer-house, took one of the chairs at the little round table inside, and signed to me to take the other. I suspected what was coming when she spoke to me in the breakfast-room. I felt certain of it now. Mr. Hartwright, she said, I am going to begin by making a frank avowal to you. I am going to say, without phrase-mating, which I detest, or paying compliments, which I heartily despise, that I have come in the course of your residence with us to feel a strong friendly regard for you. I was predisposed in your favour when you first told me of your conduct towards that unhappy woman whom you met under such remarkable circumstances. Your management of the affair might not have been prudent, but it showed the self-control, the delicacy, and the compassion of a man who was naturally a gentleman. It made me expect good things from you, and you have not disappointed my expectations." She paused, but held up her hand at the same time as a sign that she awaited no answer from me before she proceeded. When I entered the summer-house no thought was in me of the woman in white, but now Miss Halcombe's own words had put the memory of my adventure back in my mind. It remained there throughout the interview. Remained, and not without a result. As your friend, she proceeded, I am going to tell you at once, in my own plain, blunt, downright language, that I have discovered your secret, without help or hint mind from any one else. Mr. Hartwright, you have thoughtlessly allowed yourself to form an attachment, a serious and devoted attachment, I am afraid, to my sister Laura. I don't put you to the pain of confessing it in so many words, because I see and know that you are too honest to deny it. I don't even blame you. I pity you for opening your heart to a hopeless affection. You have not attempted to take any underhand advantage. You have not spoken to my sister in secret. You are guilty of weakness and want of attention to your own best interests, but of nothing worse. If you had acted in any single respect less delicately and less modestly, I should have told you to leave the house without an instant's notice, or an instant's consultation of anybody. As it is, I blame the misfortune of your years and your position. I don't blame you. Shake hands. I have given you pain. I am going to give you more. But there is no help for it. Shake hands with your friend Marian Halcombe first. The sudden kindness, the warm, high-minded, fearless sympathy which met me on such mercifully equal terms, which appealed with such delicate and generous abruptness straight to my heart, my honour and my courage, overcame me in an instant. I tried to look at her when she took my hand, but my eyes were dim. I tried to thank her, but my voice failed me. "'Listen to me,' she said, considerately avoiding all notice of my loss of self-control. "'Listen to me, and let us get it over with at once.' It is a real true relief to me that I am not obliged, in what I have to say now, to enter into the question, the hard and cruel question, as I think of it, of social inequalities. Circumstances which will try you to the quick spare me the ungracious necessity of paining a man who has lived in friendly intimacy under the same roof with myself by any humiliating references to matters of rank and station. You must leave Limeridge House, Mr. Hartwright, before any more harm is done. It is my duty to say that to you, and it would be equally my duty to say it under precisely the same serious necessity if you were the representative of the oldest and wealthiest family in England. You must leave us, not because you are a teacher of drawing." She waited a moment, turned her face full on me, and, reaching across the table, laid her hand firmly on my arm. Not because you are a teacher of drawing, she repeated, but because Laura Fairley is engaged to be married." The last word went like a bullet to my heart. My arm lost all sensation of the hand that grasped it. I never moved, and never spoke. 
the sharp autumn breeze that scattered the dead leaves at our feet, came as cold to me on a sudden as if my own mad hopes were dead leaves too, whirled away by the wind like the rest. Hopes. Betrothed or not betrothed, she was equally far from me. Would other men have remembered that in my place? Not if they'd loved her as I did. The pang passed, and nothing but the dull, numbing pain of it remained. I felt Miss Halcombe's hand again, tightening its hold on my arm. I raised my head and looked at her. Her large black eyes were rooted on me, watching the white change on my face which I felt and which she saw. Crush it, she said. Here where you first saw her, crush it. Don't shrink under it like a woman. Tear it out. Trample it under foot like a man. The suppressed vehemence with which she spoke, the strength which her will concentrated in the look she fixed on me, and in the hold on my arm that she had not yet relinquished, communicated to mine, steadied me. We both waited for a minute in silence. At the end of that time I had justified her generous faith in my manhood. I had, outwardly at least, recovered my self-control. Are you yourself again? Enough myself, Miss Halcombe, to ask your pardon and hers. Enough myself to be guided by your advice, and to prove my gratitude in that way, if I can prove it in no other. You've proved it already, she answered by those words, Mr. Hartwright. Concealment is at an end between us. I cannot affect to hide from you what my sister has unconsciously shown to me. You must leave us for her sake as well as for your own. Your presence here, your necessary intimacy with us, harmless as it has been, God knows, in all other respects, has unsteadied her and made her wretched. I who love her better than I love my own life, I who have learnt to believe in that pure, noble, innocent nature as I believe in my religion, know but too well the secret misery of self-reproach that she has been suffering since the first shadow of a feeling disloyal to her marriage engagement entered her heart in spite of her. I don't say, it will be useless to attempt to say it after what has happened, that her engagement has ever had strong hold on her affections. It is an engagement of honour, not of love. Her father sanctioned it on his deathbed two years since. She herself neither welcomed it nor shrank from it. She was content to make it. Till you came here, she has been in the position of hundreds of other women who marry men without being greatly attracted to them or greatly repelled by them, and who learn to love them, when they don't learn to hate, after marriage, instead of before. I hope more earnestly than words can say, and you should have the self-sacrificing courage to hope too, that the new thoughts and feelings which have disturbed the old calmness and the old content have not taken root too deeply to be ever removed. Your absence, if I had less belief in your honour and your courage and your sense, I should not trust to them as I am trusting now, your absence will help my efforts, and time will help us all three. It is something to know that my first confidence in you was not all misplaced. It is something to know that you will not be less honest, less manly, less considerate towards the pupil whose relation to yourself you have had the misfortune to forget than towards the stranger and the outcast, whose appeal to you was not made in vain. Again, the chance reference to the woman in white. There was no possibility of speaking of Miss Fairley and of me without raising the memory of Anne Catherick, and setting her between us, like a fatality that it was hopeless to avoid. "'Tell me what apology I can make to Mr. Fairley for breaking my engagement,' I said. Tell me when to go after that apology is accepted. I promise implicit obedience to you and to your advice. Time is every way of importance, she answered. You heard me refer this morning to Monday next, and to the necessity of setting the purple room in order. The visitor whom we expect on Monday, I could not wait for her to be more explicit. Knowing what I knew now, the memory of Miss Fairley's look and manner at the breakfast-table told me that the expected visitor at Limeridge House was her future husband. I tried to force it back, but something rose within me at that moment stronger than my own will, and I interrupted Miss Halcombe. "'Let me go to-day,' 
I said bitterly, the sooner the better. No, not to-day, she replied. The only reason you can assign to Mr. Fairley for your departure, before the end of your engagement, must be that an unforeseen necessity compels you to ask his permission to return at once to London. You must wait until to-morrow to tell him that, at the time when the post comes in, because he will then understand the sudden change in your plans by associating it with the arrival of a letter from London. It is miserable and sickening to descend to deceit, even of the most harmless kind, but I know Mr. Fairley, and if you once excite his suspicions that you are trifling with him, he will refuse to release you. Speak to him on Friday morning. Occupy yourself afterwards, for the sake of your own interests with your employer, in leaving your unfinished work in as little confusion as possible, and quit this place on Saturday. It will be time enough then, Mr. Hartwright, for you and for all of us." Before I could assure her that she might depend on my acting in the strictest accordance with her wishes, we were both startled by advancing footsteps in the shrubbery. Someone was coming from the house to seek for us. I felt the blood rush to my cheeks and then leave them again. Could the third person, who was fast approaching us, at such a time and under such circumstances, be Miss Fairley? It was a relief. So sadly, so hopelessly, was my position towards her changed already. It was absolutely a relief to me, when the person who disturbed us appeared at the entrance of the summer-house, and proved to be only Miss Fairley's maid. "'Could I speak with you a moment, miss?' said the girl, in a rather flurried, unsettled manner. Miss Halcombe descended the steps into the shrubbery, and walked aside a few paces with the maid. Left by myself, my mind reverted with a sense of forlorn wretchedness which it is not in any words that I can find to describe, to my approaching return to the solitude and the despair of my lonely London home. Thoughts of my kind old mother and of my sister, who had rejoiced with her so innocently over my prospects in Cumberland, thoughts whose long banishment from my heart it was now my shame and my reproach to realise for the first time, came back to me with the loving mournfulness of old neglected friends. My mother and my sister! What would they feel when I returned to them from my broken engagement with the confession of my miserable secret, they who had parted from me so hopefully on that last happy night in the Hampstead cottage? Anne Catherick again! Even the memory of the farewell evening with my mother and my sister could not return to me now, unconnected, with that other memory of the moonlit walk back to London. What did it mean? Were that woman and I to meet once more? It was possible, at the least. Did she know that I lived in London? Yes, I told her so, either before or after that strange question of hers, when she'd asked me so distrustfully if I knew many men of the rank of baronet, either before or after, my mind was not calm enough then to remember which. A few minutes elapsed before Miss Halcombe dismissed the maid and came back to me. She too looked flurried and unsettled now. "'We've arranged all that's necessary, Mr. Hartwright,' she said. "'We've understood each other as friends should, and we may go back to the house at once.' To tell the truth, I am uneasy about Laura. She is sent to say she wants to see me directly, and the maid reports that her mistress is apparently very much agitated by a letter that she has received this morning, the same letter, no doubt, which I sent on to the house before we came here. We retraced our steps together hastily along the shrubbery path. Although Miss Halcombe had ended all that she thought it necessary to say on her side, I had not ended all that I wanted to say on mine. From the moment when I had discovered that the unexpected visitor at Limeridge was Miss Fairley's future husband, I had felt a bitter curiosity, a burning envious eagerness, to know who he was. It was possible that a future opportunity of putting the question might not easily offer, so I risked asking it on our way back to the house. "'Now that you are kind enough to tell me we have understood each other, Miss Halcombe,' I said, "'now that you are sure of my gratitude for your forbearance, and my obedience to your wishes. May I venture to ask who—' I hesitated. 
I had forced myself to think of him, but it was harder still to speak of him as her promised husband. Who the gentleman engaged to Miss Fairley is? Her mind was evidently occupied with the message she had received from her sister. She answered in a hasty, absent way, A gentleman with a large property in Hampshire. Hampshire? Anne Catherick's native place. Again and yet again, the woman in white. There was a fatality in it. And his name? I said, as quietly and differently as I could. Sir Percival Glyde. Sir? Sir Percival? Anne Catherick's question, that suspicious question about the men of the rank of baronet whom I might happen to know, had hardly been dismissed from my mind by Miss Halcombe's return to me in the summer-house, before it was recalled again by her own answer. I stopped suddenly and looked at her. Sir Percival Glyde, she repeated, imagining that I had not heard her former reply. Knight or baronet? I asked, with an agitation that I could hide no longer. She paused for a moment, and then answered rather coldly, Baronet, of course. Eleven. Not a word more was said on either side as we walked back to the house. Miss Halcombe hastened immediately to her sister's room, and I withdrew to my studio to set in order all Mr. Fairley's drawings that I had not yet mounted and restored, before I resigned them to the care of other hands. Thoughts that I had hitherto restrained, thoughts that made my position harder than ever to endure, crowded on me now that I was alone. She was engaged to be married, and her future husband was Sir Percival Glyde, a man of the rank of baronet, and the owner of property in Hampshire. There were hundreds of baronets in England, and dozens of landowners in Hampshire. Judging by the ordinary rules of evidence, I had not the shadow of a reason thus far for connecting Sir Percival Glyde with the suspicious words of inquiry that had been spoken to me by the woman in white. And yet I did connect him with them. It was because he had now become associated in my mind with Miss Fairley, Miss Fairley being in her turn associated with Anne Catherick, since the night when I had discovered the ominous likeness between them. Had the events of the morning so unnerved me already that I was at the mercy of any delusion which common chances and common coincidences might suggest to my imagination? Impossible to say. I could only feel that what had passed between Miss Halcombe and myself on our way from the summer-house had affected me very strangely. The foreboding of some undiscoverable danger lying hid from us all in the darkness of the future was strong on me. The doubt whether I was not linked already to a chain of events which even my approaching departure from Cumberland would be powerless to snap asunder, the doubt whether we any of us saw the end as the end would really be, gathered more and more darkly over my mind. Poignant as it was, the sense of suffering caused by the miserable end of my brief presumptuous love seemed to be blunted and deadened by the still stronger sense of something obscurely impending, something invisibly threatening, that time was holding over our heads. I had been engaged with the drawings little more than half an hour, when there was a knock at the door. It opened on my answering, and, to my surprise, Miss Halcombe entered the room. Her manner was angry and agitated. She caught up a chair for herself before I could give her one, and sat down in it, close to my side. Mr. Hartwright, she said, I hope that all painful subjects of conversation were exhausted between us for to-day at least, but it is not to be so. There is some underhand villainy at work to frighten my sister about her approaching marriage. You saw me send the gardener on to the house with a letter addressed in a strange handwriting to Miss Fairley. Certainly. The letter is an anonymous letter, a vile attempt to injure Sir Percival Glyde in my sister's estimation. It has so agitated and alarmed her that I have had the greatest possible difficulty in composing her spirit sufficiently to allow me to leave her room and come here. I know this is a family matter which I ought not to consult you, and in which you can feel no concern or interest. I beg your pardon, Miss Halcombe. I feel the strongest possible concern and interest in anything that affects Miss Fairley's happiness or yours. I am glad to hear you say so. You are the only person in the house or out of it who can advise me. 
Mr. Fairley, in his state of health, and with his horror of difficulties and mysteries of all kinds, is not to be thought of. The clergyman is a good, weak man, who knows nothing out of the routine of his duties, and our neighbours are just the sort of comfortable, jog-trot acquaintances, whom one cannot disturb in times of trouble and danger. What I want to know is this. Ought I at once to take such steps as I can to discover the writer of the letter, or ought I to wait, and apply to Mr. Fairley's legal adviser to-morrow? It is a question, perhaps a very important one, of gaining or losing a day. Tell me what you think, Mr. Hartwright. If necessity had not already obliged me to take you into my confidence under very delicate circumstances, even my helpless situation would perhaps be no excuse for me. But as things are, I surely cannot be wrong. After all that has passed between us, in forgetting that you are a friend of only three months' standing, she gave me the letter. It began abruptly, without any preliminary form of address, as follows. Do you believe in dreams? I hope, for your own sake, that you do. See what Scripture says about dreams and their fulfilment. Genesis chapter 40, verse 8, chapter 41, verse 25. Daniel chapter 4, verse 18 to 25, and take the warning I send you before it is too late. Last night I dreamt about you, Miss Fairley. I dreamt that I was standing inside the communion rails of a church, I on one side of the altar table, and the clergyman with his surplice and his prayer book on the other. After a time there walked towards us, down the aisle of the church, a man and a woman coming to be married. You were the woman. You looked so pretty and innocent in your beautiful white silk dress and your long white lace veil that my heart felt for you, and the tears came into my eyes. They were tears of pity, young lady, that heaven blesses, and instead of falling from my eyes like the everyday tears that we all of us shed, they turned into two rays of light which slanted nearer and nearer to the man standing at the altar with you, till they touched his breast. The two rays sprang ill arches like two rainbows between me and him. I looked along them, and I saw down into his inmost heart. The outside of the man you were marrying was fair enough to see. He was neither tall nor short. He was a little below the average size, a light, active, high-spirited man, about five-and-forty years old, to look at. He had a pale face and was bald over the forehead, but had dark hair on the rest of his head. His beard was shaven on his chin, but was let to grow of a fine, rich brown on his cheeks and his upper lip. His eyes were brown, too, and very bright. His nose straight and handsome, and delicate enough to have done for a woman's. His hands the same. He was troubled from time to time with a dry hacking cough, and when he put up his white right hand to his mouth, he showed the red scar of an old wound across the back of it. Have I dreamt of the right man? You know best, Miss Fairley, and you can say if I was deceived or not. Read next what I saw beneath the outside. I entreat you, read and profit. I looked along the two rays of light, and I saw down into his inmost heart. It was black as night, and on it were written, in the red flaming letters which are the handwriting of the fallen angel, without pity and without remorse. He has strewn with misery the paths of others, and he will live to strew with misery the path of this woman by his side. I read that and then the rays of light shifted and pointed over his shoulder, and there, behind him, stood a fiend laughing, and the rays of light shifted once more and pointed over your shoulder, and there, behind you, stood an angel weeping, and the rays of light shifted for the third time and pointed straight between you and that man. They widened and widened, thrusting you both asunder, one from the other, and the clergyman looked for the marriage service in vain. It was gone out of the book, and he shut up the leaves and put it from him in despair. And I woke with my eyes full of tears and my heart beating, for I believe in dreams. 
Believe too, Miss Fairley. I beg of you, for your own sake, believe as I do. Joseph and Daniel and others in Scripture believed in dreams. Inquire into the past life of that man with a scar on his hand, before you say the words that make you his miserable wife. I don't give you this warning on my account, but on yours. I have an interest in your well-being that will live as long as I draw breath. Your mother's daughter has a tender place in my heart. For your mother was my first, my best, my only friend. There, the extraordinary letter ended, without signature of any sort. The handwriting afforded no prospect of a clue. It was traced on ruled lines in the cramped conventional copy-book character, technically termed small hand. It was feeble and faint, and defaced by blots, but had otherwise nothing to distinguish it. That is not an illiterate letter, said Miss Halcombe, and at the same time it is surely too incoherent to be the letter of an educated person in the highest ranks of life. The reference to the bridal dress and veil, and other little expressions, seemed to point to it as the production of some woman. What do you think, Mr. Hartwright? I think so, too. It seems to me to be not only the letter of a woman, but of a woman whose mind must be deranged, suggested Miss Halcombe. It struck me in that light, too. I did not answer. While I was speaking, my eyes rested on the last sentence of the letter. Your mother's daughter has a tender place in my heart, for your mother was my first, my best, my only friend. Those words, and the doubt which had just escaped me as to the sanity of the writer of the letter, acting together on my mind, suggested an idea which I was literally afraid to express openly, or even to encourage secretly. I began to doubt whether my own faculties were not in danger of losing their balance. It seemed almost like a monomania to be tracing back everything strange that happened, everything unexpected that was said, always to the same hidden source and the same sinister influence. I resolved this time, in defence of my own courage and my own sense, to come to no decision that plain fact did not warrant, and to turn my back resolutely on everything that tempted me in the shape of surmise. If we have any chance of tracing the person who has written this, I said, returning the letter to Miss Halcombe, there can be no harm in seizing our opportunity the moment it offers. I think we ought to speak to the gardener again about the elderly woman who gave him the letter, and then to continue our inquiries in the village. But first, let me ask a question. You mentioned just now the alternative of consulting Mr. Fairley's legal adviser tomorrow. Is there no possibility of communicating with him earlier? Why not today? I can only explain, replied Miss Halcombe, by entering into certain particulars connected with my sister's marriage engagement, which I did not think it necessary or desirable to mention to you this morning. One of Sir Percival Glyde's objects in coming here on Monday is to fix the period of his marriage, which has hitherto been left quite unsettled. He is anxious that the event should take place before the end of the year. Does Miss Fairley know of that wish? I asked eagerly. She has no suspicion of it. After what has happened, I shall not take the responsibility upon myself of enlightening her. Sir Percival has only mentioned his views to Mr. Fairley, who has told me himself that he is ready and anxious, as Laura's guardian, to forward them. He has written to London to the family solicitor, Mr. Gilmore. Mr. Gilmore happens to be away in Glasgow on business, and he has replied by proposing to stop at Limeridge House on his way back to town. He will be arriving to-morrow and will stay with us a few days, so as to allow Sir Percival time to plead his own cause. If he succeeds, Mr. Gilmore will then return to London, taking with him his instructions for my sister's marriage settlement. You understand now, Mr. Hartwright, why I speak of waiting to take legal advice until tomorrow. Mr. Gilmore is the old and tried friend of two generations of Fairleys, and we can trust him as we could trust no one else. The marriage settlement the mere hearing of those two words stung me with a jealous despair that was poison to my higher and better instincts. I began to think, it's hard to confess this, but I must suppress nothing from beginning to end of the terrible story that I now stand committed to reveal. 
I began to think, with a hateful eagerness of hope, of the vague charges against Sir Percival Glyde which the anonymous letter contained. What if those wild accusations rested on a foundation of truth? What if their truth could be proved, before the fatal words of consent were spoken, and the marriage settlement was drawn? I've tried to think since that the feeling which then animated me began and ended in pure devotion to Miss Fairley's interests, but I have never succeeded in deceiving myself into believing it, and I must not now attempt to deceive others. The feeling began and ended in reckless, vindictive, hopeless hatred of the man who was to marry her. If we're to find out anything, I said, speaking under the new influence which was now directing me, we had better not let another minute slip by us unemployed. I can only suggest once more the propriety of questioning the gardener a second time, and of inquiring in the village immediately afterwards. "'I think I may be able to help you in both cases,' said Miss Halcombe, rising. "'Let's go, Mr. Hartwright, at once, and do the best we can together.' I had the door in my hand to open it for her, but I stopped, on a sudden, to ask an important question before we set forth. "'One of the paragraphs in the anonymous letter,' I said, "'contains some sentences of minute personal description. Sir Percival Glyde's name is not mentioned, I know, but does that description at all resemble him? Accurately, even stating his age to be forty-five. Forty-five, and she was not yet twenty-one. Men of his age married wives of her age every day, and experience had shown those marriages to be often the happiest ones. I knew that. And yet even the mention of his age, when I contrasted it with hers, added to my blind hatred and distrust of him. Accurately, Miss Holcombe continued, even to the scar on his right hand, which is the scar of a wound that he received years since when he was travelling in Italy, there can be no doubt that every peculiarity of his personal appearance is thoroughly well known to the writer of the letter. Even a cough that he is troubled with is mentioned, if I remember right. Yes, and mentioned correctly. He treats it lightly himself, though it sometimes makes his friends anxious about him. I suppose no whispers have ever been heard against his character. Mr. Hartwright, I hope you are not unjust enough to let that infamous letter influence you. I felt the blood rush to my cheeks, for I knew it had influenced me. I, I hope not, I answered confusedly. Perhaps I had no right to ask the question. I am not sorry you asked it, she said, for it enables me to do justice to Sir Percival's reputation. Not a whisper, Mr. Hartwright, has ever reached me or my family against him. He has fought successfully two contested elections, and has come out of the ordeal unscathed. A man who can do that in England is a man whose character is established." I opened the door for her in silence, and followed her out. She had not convinced me. If the recording angel had come down from heaven to confirm her, and had opened his book to my mortal eyes, the recording angel would not have convinced me. We found the gardener at work as usual. No amount of questioning could extract a single answer of any importance from the lad's impenetrable stupidity. The woman who had given him the letter was an elderly woman. She had not spoken a word to him, and she had gone away towards the south in a great hurry. That was all the gardener could tell us. The village lay southward of the house. So to the village we went next. Twelve. Our inquiries at Limeridge were patiently pursued in all directions, and among all sorts and conditions of people, but nothing came of them. Three of the villagers did certainly assure us that they had seen the woman, but as they were quite unable to describe her, and quite incapable of agreeing about the exact direction in which she was proceeding when they last saw her, these three bright exceptions to the general rule of total ignorance afforded no more real assistance to us than the mass of their unhelpful and unobservant neighbours. The course of our useless investigations brought us in time to the end of the village at which the schools established by Miss Fairley were situated. As we passed the side of the building appropriated to the use of the boys, I suggested the propriety of making a last inquiry of the schoolmaster, whom we might presume to be, in virtue of his office, the most intelligent man in the place. I'm afraid the schoolmaster must have been occupied with his scholars, said Miss Halcombe just at the time when the woman passed through the village and returned again. However, we can but try. 
we entered the playground enclosure and walked by the schoolroom window to get round to the door which was situated at the back of the building. I stopped for a moment at the window and looked in. The schoolmaster was sitting at his high desk with his back to me, apparently haranguing the pupils, who were all gathered together in front of him with one exception. The one exception was a sturdy, white-haired boy, standing apart from all the rest, on a stool in the corner, a forlorn little Crusoe, isolated in his own desert island of solitary penal disgrace. The door when we got round to it was ajar, and the schoolmaster's voice reached us plainly, as we both stopped for a minute under the porch. "'Now, boys,' said the voice, "'no mind what I tell you. If I hear another word spoken about ghosts in this school, it will be the worse for all of you. There are no such things as ghosts, and therefore any boy who believes in ghosts believes in what can't possibly be, and a boy who belongs to Limeridge School and believes in what can't possibly be sets up his back against reason and discipline, and must be punished accordingly. You all see Jacob Prosselthwaite standing up on the stool there in disgrace. He has been punished, not because he said he saw a ghost last night, but because he is too impudent and too obstinate to listen to reason, and because he persists in saying he saw the ghost after I have told him that no such thing can possibly be. If nothing else will do, I mean to cane the ghost out of Jacob Prothelswaite, and if the thing spreads among any of the rest of you, I mean to go a step further and cane the ghost out of the whole school." "'We seem to have chosen an awkward moment for our visit,' said Miss Halcombe, pushing open the door at the end of the schoolmaster's address and leading the way in. Our appearance produced a strong sensation among the boys. They appeared to think that we had arrived for the express purpose of seeing Jacob Prosselthwaite caned. "'Go home, all of you, to dinner,' said the schoolmaster, "'except Jacob. Jacob must stop where he is, and the ghost may bring him his dinner if the ghost pleases.' Jacob's fortitude deserted him at the double disappearance of his schoolfellows and his prospect of dinner. He took his hands out of his pockets, looked hard at his knuckles, raised them with great deliberation to his eyes, and when they got there ground them round and round slowly, accompanying the action by short spasms of sniffing, which followed each other at regular intervals. The nasal minute-guns of juvenile distress. "'We came here to ask you a question, Mr. Dempster,' said Miss Halcombe, addressing the schoolmaster. "'And we little expected to find you occupied in exorcising a ghost. What does it all mean? What has really happened?' "'That wicked boy has been frightening the whole school, Miss Halcombe, by declaring that he saw a ghost yesterday evening,' answered the master. "'And he still persists in his absurd story, in spite of all that I can say to him.' "'Most extraordinary,' said Miss Halcombe. I should not have thought it possible that any of the boys had imagination enough to see a ghost. This is a new accession indeed to the hard labour of forming the youthful mind at Limeridge, and I heartily wish you well through it, Mr. Dempster. In the meantime, let me explain why you see me here, and what it is I want." She then put the same question to the schoolmaster, which we had already asked of almost every one else in the village. It was met with the same discouraging answer. Mr. Dempster had not set eyes on the stranger of whom we were in search. "'We may as well return to the house, Mr. Hartwright,' said Miss Halcombe. "'The information we want is evidently not to be found.' She had bowed to Mr. Dempster, and was about to leave the schoolroom, when the forlorn position of Jacob Brothelthwaite, piteously sniffing on the stool of penitence, attracted her attention as she passed him, and made her stop good-humouredly to speak a word to the little prisoner before she opened the door. "'You foolish boy,' she said. "'Why don't you beg Mr. Dempster's pardon, and hold your tongue about the ghost?' "'Eh, but I saw to ghost!' persisted Jacob Brothelswaite, with a stare of terror and a burst of tears. "'Stuff and nonsense! You saw nothing of the kind! Ghost, indeed! What ghost?' "'I beg your pardon, Miss Halcombe,' interposed the schoolmaster a little uneasily. "'But I think you'd better not question the boy. The obstinate folly of his story is beyond all belief.' "'And you might lead him into ignorantly—' "'Ignorantly what?' inquired Miss Halcombe, somewhat sharply. "'Ignorantly shocking your feelings,' said Mr. Dempster, looking very much discomposed. "'Upon my word, Mr. Dempster, you pay my feelings a great compliment in thinking them weak enough to be shocked by such an urchin as that. 
she turned with an air of satirical defiance to little Jacob, and began to question him directly. Come, she said. I mean to know all about this, you naughty boy. When did you see the ghost? Yesterday in at the gloaming, replied Jacob. Oh, you saw it yesterday evening in the twilight. And what was it like? All in white, as a ghost should be, answered the ghost seer, with a confidence beyond his ears. And where was it? Away under in the kirkyard, where a ghost ought to be. As a ghost ought to be, where a ghost ought to be. Why, you little fool, you talk as if manners and customs of ghosts had been familiar to you from your infancy. Have you got your story at your fingers' ends, at any rate? I suppose I shall hear next that you can actually tell me whose ghost it was. Eh, but I just can, replied Jacob, nodding his head with an air of gloomy triumph. Mr. Dempster had already tried several times to speak while Miss Halcombe was examining his pupil, and now he interposed resolutely enough to make himself heard. "'Excuse me, Miss Halcombe,' he said, "'if I may venture to say that you are only encouraging the boy by asking him these questions.' "'I will merely ask one more, Mr. Dempster, and then I shall be quite satisfied.' "'Well,' she continued, turning to the boy, "'and whose ghost was it?' "'To ghost of Mistress Fairley,' answered Jacob in a whisper. The effect which this extraordinary reply produced on Miss Halcombe fully justified the anxiety which the schoolmaster had shown to prevent her from hearing it. Her face crimsoned with indignation. She turned upon little Jacob with an angry suddenness which terrified him into a fresh burst of tears, opened her lips to speak to him, then controlled herself, and addressed the master instead of the boy. "'It is useless,' she said to hold such a child as that responsible for what he says. I have little doubt that the idea has been put into his head by others. If there are people in this village, Mr. Dempster, who have forgotten the respect and gratitude due from every soul in it to my mother's memory, I will find them out, and if I have any influence with Mr. Fairley, they shall suffer for it." Well, "'I hope indeed, I am sure, Miss Halcombe, that you are mistaken,' said the schoolmaster. "'The matter begins and ends with the boy's own perversity and folly. He saw, or thought he saw, a woman in white yesterday evening, as he was passing the churchyard, and the figure, real or fancied, was standing by the marble cross, which he and every one else in Limeridge knows to be the monument over Mrs. Fairley's grave. These two circumstances are surely sufficient to have suggested to the boy himself the answer which has so naturally shocked you." Although Miss Halcombe did not seem to be convinced, she evidently felt that the schoolmaster's statement of the case was too sensible to be openly combated. She merely replied by thanking him for his attention, and by promising to see him again when her doubts were satisfied. This said, she bowed, and led the way out of the schoolroom. Throughout the whole of this strange scene I had stood apart, listening attentively and drawing my own conclusions. As soon as we were alone again, Miss Halcombe asked me if I had formed any opinion on what I had heard. A very strong opinion, I answered. The boy's story, as I believe, has foundation in fact. I confess I am anxious to see the monument over Mrs. Fairley's grave, and to examine the ground around it. You shall see the grave." She paused after making that reply, and reflected a little as we walked on. "'What has happened in the schoolroom?' she resumed has so completely distracted my attention from the subject of the letter, that I feel a little bewildered when I try to return to it. Must we give up all idea of making any further inquiries, and wait to place the whole thing in Mr. Gilmore's hands to-morrow? By no means, Miss Halcombe. What has happened in the schoolroom encourages me to persevere in the investigation. Why does it encourage you? Because it strengthens a suspicion I felt when you gave me the letter to read. I suppose you had your reasons, Mr. Hartwright, for concealing that suspicion from me until this moment?" I was afraid to encourage it in myself. I thought it was utterly preposterous. I distrusted it as the result of some perversity in my own imagination. But I can do so no longer. Not only the boy's own answers to your questions, but even a chance expression that dropped from the schoolmaster's lips in explaining his story have forced the idea back into my mind. Events may yet prove that idea to be an illusion, Miss Halcombe, but the belief is strong in me at this moment that the fancied ghost in the churchyard and the writer of the anonymous letter are one and the same person." She stopped, turned pale, 
and looked me eagerly in the face. What person? The schoolmaster unconsciously told you, when he spoke of the figure that the boy saw in the churchyard, he called it a woman in white. Not Anne Catherick? Yes, Anne Catherick. She put her hand through my arm and leaned on it heavily. I don't know why, she said in low tones, but there is something in this suspicion of yours that seems to startle and unnerve me. I feel. She stopped and tried to laugh it off. Miss Hartwright, she went on, I will show you the grave, and then go back at once to the house. I'd better not leave Laura too long alone. I'd better go back and sit with her. We were close to the churchyard when she spoke. The church, a dreary building of grey stone, was situated in a little valley, so as to be sheltered from the bleak winds blowing over the moorland all around it. The burial ground advanced from the side of the church a little way up the slope of the hill, and was surrounded by a rough low stone wall, and was bare and open to the sky except at one extremity, where a brook trickled down the stony hillside, and a clump of dwarf trees threw their narrow shadows over the short meagre grass. Just beyond the brook and the trees, and not far from one of the three stone stiles which afforded entrance at various points to the churchyard, rose the white marble cross that distinguished Mrs. Fairley's grave from the humbler monuments scattered about it. "'I need go no further with you,' said Miss Halcombe, pointing to the grave. "'You will let me know if you find anything to confirm the idea you have just mentioned to me. Let us meet again at the house.' she left me. I descended at once to the churchyard, and crossed the stile, which led directly to Mrs. Fairley's grave. The grass about it was too short, and the ground too hard, to show any marks of footsteps. Disappointed thus far, I next looked attentively at the cross, and at the square block of marble below it, on which the inscription was cut. The natural whiteness of the cross was a little clouded here and there by weather stains, and rather more than half of the square block beneath it. On the side which bore the inscription was in the same condition. The other half, however, attracted my attention at once by its singular freedom from stain or impurity of any kind. I looked closer, and saw that it had been cleaned, recently cleaned, in a downward direction from top to bottom. The boundary line between the part that had been cleaned and the part that were, had not was traceable wherever the inscription left a blank space of marble, sharply traceable, as a line that had been produced by artificial means. Who had begun the cleansing of the marble, and who had left it unfinished? I looked about me, wondering how the question was to be solved. No sign of a habitation could be discerned from the point at which I was standing. The burial ground was left in the lonely possession of the dead. I returned to the church, and walked round it, till I came to the back of the building, then crossed the boundary wall beyond, by another of the stone stiles, and found myself at the head of a path, leading down to a deserted stone quarry. Against one side of the quarry a little two-room cottage was built, and just outside the door an old woman was engaged in washing. I walked up to her, and entered into conversation about the church and burial ground. She was ready enough to talk and almost the first words she said informed me that her husband fulfilled the two offices of clerk and sexton. I said a few words next in praise of Mrs. Fairley's monument. The old woman shook her head, and told me I had not seen it at its best. It was her husband's business to look after it, but he had been so ailing and weak for months and months past that he had hardly been able to crawl into church on Sundays to do his duty, and the monument had been neglected in consequence. He was getting a little better now, and in a week or ten days' time he hoped to be strong enough to set to work and clean it. This information, extracted from a long, rambling answer in the broadest Cumberland accent, told me all that I most wanted to know. I gave the poor woman a trifle, and returned at once to Limeridge House. The partial cleaning of the monument had evidently been accomplished by a strange hand connecting what I had discovered thus far with what I had suspected after hearing the story of the ghost seen at twilight, I wanted nothing more to confirm my resolution to watch Mrs. Fairley's grave in secret that evening, returning to it at sunset, and waiting within sight of it till night fell. 
the work of cleansing the monument had been left unfinished, and the person by whom it had been begun might return to complete it. On getting back to the house, I informed Miss Halcombe of what I intended to do. She looked surprised and uneasy while I was explaining my purpose, but she made no positive objection to the execution of it. She only said, I hope it may end well. Just as she was leaving me again, I stopped her to inquire as calmly as I could after Miss Fairley's health. She was in better spirits, and Miss Halcombe hoped that she might be induced to take a little walking exercise while the afternoon sun lasted. I returned to my own room, to resume setting the drawings in order. It was necessary to do this, and doubly necessary to keep my mind employed on anything that would help to distract my attention from myself and from the hopeless future that lay before me. From time to time I paused in my work to look out of the window and watch the sky as the sun sank nearer and nearer to the horizon. On one of those occasions I saw a figure on the broad gravel walk under my window. It was Miss Fairley. I had not seen her since the morning, and I had hardly spoken to her then. Another day at Limeridge was all that remained to me, and after that day my eyes might never look upon her again. This thought was enough to hold me at the window. I had sufficient consideration for her to arrange the blind so that she might not see me if she looked up, but I had no strength to resist the temptation of letting my eyes at least follow her as far as they could on her walk. She was dressed in a brown cloak, with a plain black silk gown under it. On her head was the same simple straw hat which she had worn on the morning we first met. A veil was attached to it, now, which hid her face from me. By her side trotted a little Italian greyhound, the pet companion of all her walks, smartly dressed in a scarlet cloth wrapper, to keep the sharp air from his delicate skin. She did not seem to notice the dog. She walked straight forward, with her head drooping a little, and her arms folded in her cloak. The dead leaves which had swirled in the wind before me, when I had heard of her marriage engagement in the morning, whirled in the wind before her, and rose and fell, and scattered themselves at her feet as she walked on in the pale waning sunlight. The dog shivered and trembled, and pressed against her dress impatiently for notice and encouragement, but she never heeded him. She walked on further and further away from me, with the dead leaves whirling about her on the path, walked on, till my aching eyes could see her no more, when I was left alone again, with my heavy heart. In another hour's time I had done my work, and the sunset was at hand. I got my hat and coat in the hall, and slipped out of the house without meeting anyone. The clouds were wild in the western heaven, and the wind blew chill from the sea. Far as the shore was, the sound of the surf swept over the intervening moorland, and beat drearily in my ears when I entered the churchyard. Not a living creature was in sight. The place looked lonelier than ever, as I chose my position, and waited and watched, with my eyes on the white cross that rose over Mrs. Fairley's grave. End of Track 4